part two. All right, so let's get down a few things here. I'm gonna get my manual back up for you party people. Let's see it here. I'm gonna share my screen so you guys can see it as well. And I'll kind of show you what to highlight just like every other day. So here we go, share chapter four. Okay, so um, stopping. So if I, for example, were to be um, walking across the street and not a crosswalk, um, cars would have to stop for me. Um, pedestrians always have the right of way, even if they are not in a marked crosswalk. I mean, should a pedestrian go to the crosswalk 100%? Um, are you at risk of getting a ticket if you just walk across wherever you want on the road and you're not in a crosswalk? Yes, you can get a jaywalking ticket for sure. Um, but pedestrians always have the right of way, even if they are not in a marked crosswalk. You have to remember that us as drivers, we need to stop for them. We're not going to be like, Oh, well, you're on the crosswalk. I can run you over. No, it's not the way it works. Um, but pedestrians always have the right of way, even if they are not in a marked crosswalk. So make sure that you remember that. Um, so when you're looking at our packet that we're going to do in a little bit, even if the pedestrian has one foot on the road, they automatically have the right of way. Okay. If they're just looking at the road, they do not have the right of way. But if they have their foot on the road, us as drivers, we need to stop for them. Okay. Now, Talking more about stopping, if we come up to a stop sign, okay, and there is no crosswalk around. So usually if we come up to a stop sign, there would be a crosswalk there or a stop line. It's just a big white line. We would stop behind that. But if there is no crosswalk or stop line, like maybe you're on a back country road and it's like a dirt road and obviously they're not gonna like paint those big, huge white crosswalk things on the ground. Um, so if there is no crosswalk, we're gonna stop two feet back two feet back from the stop sign. I put a big huge number two right here in the margin on my um, manual. Um, but we're gonna continue going down. We're gonna go to flashing red lights. Uh, so flashing red lights, you need to make sure if you see a school bus with their lights on um, that you are being cautious, obviously. I mean, I have a son, he is in kindergarten and he is wild. And I can guarantee you when the lights are yellow, um, us as drivers, we do not have to stop, but I can guarantee you, like my kids, like already kind of running around thinking about, oh, I'm going to get on the school bus. So you guys need to make sure like, yes, even if the lights are not red, that you are looking around for kids that may be excited, like my kid to get on the bus. I mean, it's a big time for them. They love the school bus. I don't get it, but, um, make sure that you're keeping an eye out. You're looking for kids, even if the school bus does not have the flashing red lights. Yellow is just telling you that it's going to stop. Red is when it's, when it's going to actually stop. Um, and you have to stop for the red. Uh, permit test question for sure. Um, danger zone around a school bus is 20 feet. So make sure that you highlight that or write that down or whatever you got to do. And then you can also get a ticket if you do not stop for a school bus with the red lights on. And that's going to be a $500 fine. Honestly, I think it should be more. Why on earth would you run past the school bus? Like, why would you drive past that if there's little kids getting on the bus? That's kind of sad. Um, but the only time you would not have to stop for a school bus with its lights on is if you were on the opposite side of the divided highway. And I do have a picture of that. I'm a visual gal, so I got to show you. Um, but right here, oh, I'm on the wrong one. This is not the picture that's going to come up right here. That's what I'm looking for. So right here. So this would be the opposite side of the divided highway. I actually have two pictures. So both of them. So a divided highway would be like this grass right here. Um, it could be a fence, it could be a raised barrier, it could be a row of flowers, it could be a small little concrete one, like enforced like between like Culver's and TCF, well now it's Huntington, but like the divide between us is just a little tiny concrete, and that would be just enough to call it a divided highway. But if you look at this one right here, um, this is another divided highway. If this emergency vehicle had its lights on, this semi would not have to stop, okay? And if there was just all open lanes and no divide, all lanes would need to stop, make a full complete stop if they seen an emergency vehicle or a school bus with its lights on. Um, so if there's no divide, you all have to stop, make a full complete stop. If there is a divide, you would not have to stop if you were on the opposite side of the divided highway, okay? Now we are gonna go to um, so the school buses, we're going to watch a quick video really quick. Um, this is also going to be question number one on your outline. So make sure that you're listening. The, um, answer to your outline question number one is going to be in this video. Okay. So let's go to day three videos. And this is about school buses. Okay.
school bus stop arms exist to protect children as they are picked up or dropped off at school or home. We'll examine requirements for vehicle drivers regarding school bus stop arm safety, how these requirements are enforced, the consequences for violations, and how you as a motorist can help keep our children safe. In Minnesota, school buses make at least 10,000 trips daily. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, children are eight times safer riding a bus to school than any other vehicle. Their safety while getting on and off the bus is crucial. And this is why stop arms were implemented decades ago. Yet, violation of laws regarding stop arms continue to occur on a daily basis, endangering our children statewide. Every year, we hear stories of children being hit or nearly hit by vehicles not obeying the stop arm law. It was my first stop in the afternoon. I had uh, signaled as I turned a corner, activated my eight ways, opened the door, the stop arms out, the red lights are on, and the children were departing the bus. And my son came running in the house and said that Evelyn was hit by a car. Bus was stopped, stop arm down and everything. And as she's crossing the street, there was an oncoming vehicle. The bus driver honked the horn, yelled Evelyn's name out the window. The car was not going to stop. And Evelyn stopped and looked back at the bus driver and then kept going because she didn't understand what was going on. And she hesitated just enough for the car not to fully hit her. Um, but she did keep going a little bit and the car clipped her. Knocked her to the ground. The rear tire ran over her foot. I'm very grateful because if Mickey, the bus driver, did not um, stop her or slow her down, she would have been right in front of the car. It's eye-opening having firsthand experience with your kid getting hit by a car by someone failing to stop at a stop arm for a bus. It was the next day she didn't want her at the school bus because she didn't feel safe. So it took a while for her to get back to normal. It was very hard. It's stories like these that reinforce the point that everyone needs to pay attention to their surroundings and always stop for school buses. The driver of a vehicle approaching a school bus displaying flashing red lights with the stop arm extended must stop at least 20 feet away from the bus. On two lane roadways, all traffic from both directions must stop when a school bus extends its stop arm and activates the flashing red lights. The driver must not move until the stop arm is retracted and the red lights are no longer flashing. Even if the two lane roadway has a center turn lane, vehicles in all lanes are required to stop. A four lane roadway without median separation requires all vehicles traveling in both directions to stop. On a highway with four lanes or more, with a separating median such as a cement wall or boulevard, only traffic traveling in the same direction of the school bus is required to stop. Failure to stop is illegal, and many school buses are equipped with cameras to help identify and prosecute violators. It's important to know that violating laws regarding school bus stop arms is a serious offense. At the very least, a misdemeanor can result in a minimum $500 fine. Charges of a gross misdemeanor can result if a driver passes a stopped bus on the passenger door side or attempts to pass while a child is outside the bus or on an adjacent sidewalk. Varying degrees of felony charges can result should an injury or fatality occur. Distracted driving plays a significant role in drivers failing to yield for school buses. Minnesota is a hands-free cell phone state. That means you cannot have a phone in your hand while driving. Other distractions, such as entering GPS directions, setting a radio station, adjusting your climate control, and interacting with passengers in the car can all be distracting. Setting all distractions aside is the best way to focus 100% of your attention on the road. As a driver, it's your responsibility to know the laws regarding school bus stop arms and remain alert and patient whenever in the vicinity of a school bus or children. If possible, you may want to change your driving route or commuting schedule to avoid peak school bus activity. Make sure you know the laws regarding school bus stop arm safety on the type of roadway you are traveling. Do your part to keep Minnesota's children safe. It's scary to think of what it could have been. It, and it was really close to possibly losing our daughter.
And that's not something anybody should have to go through. For more information, or if you have any questions, visit the Minnesota Department of Public Safety at dps.mn.gov. Okay, so that was um, kind of the first three blanks of your uh, outline. That was just number one though. So that was the what percent are safer riding the school bus? What was the name of that child that almost got hit? And then uh, most school buses are equipped with what? So if you didn't catch any of those, rewind this video and watch that again. <laughs> uh, but then now we're on number two of the outline. So we're cruising. Um, but that was a three part um, question on that number one on the last video. So now we're moving on. We are going to the next page. So let's go to, uh, we're going to go to following emergency vehicles here. Where are we? Yeah, we're here. So um, an emergency vehicle, you want to make sure that you're pulling over and making a full complete stop. If there is somebody driving with their lights on, like say an emergency vehicle, fire truck, maybe it was an emergency vehicle on the way to pick somebody up for emergency, I don't know, but anything in a police car, anything like that, you would want to make sure that you're making a full complete stop. You're not rolling to a stop, a full complete stop, and you're giving that emergency vehicle 500 feet of room. I always remember fire, fire, 500. Okay. Then we're cruising still. We're going to go to sharing the road with a bicyclist. So sharing the road with the bicyclist. Here we go. So this is gonna be the next portion, number two. Um, on your outline, it says, can you drive in the bike lane? I mean, honestly, um, I would think that your first response would be, no, you can't. Um, but the answer for number two is yes, you can. Can you drive in the bike lane? You're gonna circle yes. Okay, so make sure that you do that. Okay, and then it says when. So make sure that you are writing this down. So for number two, can you drive in the bike lane? You're gonna circle yes, and then it says when, and you can drive in the bike lane when you are um, in the city. So we don't have like bike lanes around here in Forest Lake. We have bike paths, but not bike like lanes in the city of Minneapolis or St. Paul. Um, you will see, well, let's have it on my computer here. Everything's popping up. But in like Minneapolis or St. Paul, there'll be regular driving lanes. And then there'll be like a bike lane with a bicycle insignia on the ground. And then there'll be parallel parking spots. And then there'll be like the sidewalk. But you can drive in the bike lane. So like you did, you circled yes. But you can drive in those lanes when you are parallel parking. Because when you're in your regular driving lane, you'll want to scoot over the top of the bike lane and get into your parallel parking spot. So parallel parking is number one. And then the number two is when you're making a right-hand turn. Um, the bike lane is on the right-hand side of the road in the city, and when we are making a right-hand turn, we always want to get to our closest lane available, and that closest lane just happens to be the bike lane. Now, could we drive in the bike lane because, you know, we're in a hurry and there's no bikes there? No, absolutely not. That would be illegal, but we can only drive in the bike lane when we are um, parallel parking or when we are making a right turn. Okay, so make sure you're writing that down. And then we're gonna go over to number three. We're on number three of the outline. I'm kind of writing it down with you as well. I, I make this up up as I go, honestly. I don't even know what I'm gonna write down for the outline. Um, so the next thing here is we're gonna watch a little video about um, bikers and make sure you can drive in the bike lane when you are making um, a right turn or when you are parallel parking because that is a permit test question it'll literally come up and be like can you drive in the bike lane you'll hit yes and then the next question will pop up and it'll say when and you'll say when making a right turn or parking okay so make sure that you just wrote that down and you remember it and you're highlighting it in your manual as well but that is all in here if you want to see where does it say it so sharing the road with the bicyclist i wrote a big huge number three in the margin and then i did highlight all of this stuff right here if you guys want to make sure that you highlight that but otherwise i'm going to play this quick little bike video for you this is a short one this is no place for the tour de france and this is no place for nascar 
But in everyday life, bicycles and cars do share the road. I'm Robbie Ventura. I spent four years riding with Lance Armstrong and the U.S. Postal Team. I've coached hundreds of cyclists who compete around the world. And I can tell you it's no accident when everyone gets where they're going safely. The key is to know the rules of the road. For example, cyclists have a right to be on the street, and people in cars have an obligation to watch out for them. Often the road is the only way for people on bikes to get where they're going, and some sidewalks are even more dangerous than streets. Finally, some communities allow kids to ride on the sidewalk, but it may be illegal for adults. When cyclists are on the road, they're supposed to obey all traffic laws, signs, and signals, always riding in the same direction as cars in their lane. Some cyclists feel safer riding against traffic where they can see oncoming cars, but that's actually more dangerous because cars have less time to slow down and go around them. People on bikes should also ride predictably and signal so drivers know what they're planning to do. Cyclists turning right may do this or this. Here's what a left turn signal looks like. And if you see this, expect the cyclist to slow down or stop. Whether you're riding or driving, it's also important to know your place on the road. Bicycles should stay as far to the right as practical, but they may have to ride farther out into the lane if there's broken glass, rocks, and other debris by the curb or on the shoulder. People on bikes also ride farther into the lane on narrow roads to keep cars from passing too closely, or they might be moving across the lane getting ready to turn left. Like drivers, cyclists are supposed to use designated lanes if they're planning to turn. Whether you're in a car or on a bike, you should also use extra caution in key situations or danger zones. Take passing, for example. When going around a cyclist, a driver should allow at least three feet between the vehicle and the bike. More is better, especially for a cyclist going up a hill or on a high-speed road where fast-moving vehicles can generate strong air currents. On a narrow road, you might have to move into the next lane to pass safely, and that can mean waiting a few seconds for oncoming traffic to clear. Be patient. Turning can also put you in a danger zone. Say you're in a car planning to make a right turn, but there's a cyclist to your right or riding behind you. People are often tempted to speed up, get ahead of the bike, and make that turn, but doing so could cause a crash. If there's any chance you're going to block a path of a bike on the road or a parallel bike path, wait for the cyclist to pass before turning. How much time do you lose by slowing down and playing it safe? As you can see, it's only a matter of seconds. And when you're turning or changing lanes, don't forget about your blind spots. After checking your mirrors, always look quickly to your right or left. Another major risk is a car turning left in the path of an oncoming bike. In these situations, drivers may misjudge the speed and distance of cyclists or fail to see them. Bikes are smaller than cars, so they're harder to see and may appear further away. But some could be moving pretty fast, 20 or even 30 miles an hour. And if the cyclist is going straight, he has the right of way. Bike paths or sidewalks that run parallel with the road may seem like fairly safe places, but these two can be danger zones. A driver making a turn might be focused on the road and not see a cyclist traveling on a sidewalk or path until the last minute. Someone riding on a sidewalk or path in the opposite direction of a driver is even less likely to be seen. So in these situations, drivers should be extra careful checking the sidewalk or path for cyclists or pedestrians. People on bikes should ride defensively. Watch for motorists making a turn and be prepared to stop. Another danger zone involves driveways or alleys. Drivers and cyclists often cruise right into the street, pulling out of a driveway or alley, looking for cars in the middle of the lane, but not for bikes or pedestrians on the sidewalk or on the right side of the road. And if you're only looking to your left for oncoming traffic, you won't see a cyclist coming from the other direction. You have to remind yourself every time to take it slow and look both ways before entering the road. Cyclists riding along parked cars are in another danger zone because drivers and passengers sometimes open doors. This happens so often, cyclists actually have a name for it, being doors. So if you're getting out of a parked car, always look over your shoulder to make sure no cyclists are coming. And cyclists may want to ride farther into the lane. One final danger zone is right behind the wheel or handlebars. You're blocking the road. I'm trying to get by here. You have to give me room. You have to wait a second. When you're on the road, conflicts can occur, and it's tempting to express yourself. But getting angry, hostile, or abusive doesn't help. And it can take you to places you never intended to go. 
Aggressive behavior can lead to criminal charges. Revving your engine, blasting your horn, yelling or pounding on a vehicle can result in legal action against drivers or cyclists. The best advice for anyone on the road is to stay calm, exercise caution, be patient and courteous, share the road, show respect, and always be on the alert, especially in those danger zones. When passing a cyclist, leave at least three feet between car and bicycle. More is better. Be patient when passing and when turning right. If there's any chance you'll block a bike in your lane, on the sidewalk or side path, slow down and wait for the cyclist to pass. If you're making a left, remember that oncoming cars and bikes have the right of way and that bicycles may be moving faster than you think. Don't forget to check your blind spots and to signal whenever passing or turning. Be especially careful when leaving a driveway or alley. Check the street and sidewalk in both directions for cars, cyclists, and pedestrians. And look for bikes before getting out of a car that's parked in the street. Finally, keep in mind that you're not in a race where NASCAR meets the Tour de France. When you share the road, the reward is everyone gets where they're going safely. All right. So moving on here. So that was number um, three on your outline. They answered the question, what is it called when someone opens up their door on a bike? And if you didn't get that one, rewind and you can get the answer to number three. Um, but we are moving on. We're going to go talk about some semis. And these are three permit test questions. And this is going to be number four on your outline. It says um, three things to know about semis. And we are going to write those down right now. So number one is going to be that they have blind spots everywhere. So this is number four of your outline. There's one, two, three, three things to know about semis. So number four, number one is going to be the blind spots everywhere. And then they take longer to pass than a regular car. A semi does. I mean, obviously they're big. They take longer to pass. So blind spots everywhere. They take longer to pass than a regular car. And then the last one, the number three, um, is going to be, they appear to be traveling at a slower speed, but semis are usually going pretty darn quick. Honestly, I'm like sometimes scared to pass a semi. They're so fast. <laughs> um, so again, blind spots everywhere. They take longer to pass and they appear to be traveling at a slower speed. Okay. So those are three things you need to know about semis. Would it be ever wise to cut off a semi? No, um, they're just like a train. They have a very heavy load and they're not going to be able to just stop on a dime. So make sure that you are not cutting off a semi. Make sure that you are avoiding these no zones. That would be the red areas. Um, the rule of thumb is if you cannot see the semi drivers outside mirrors, they can't see you. OK, so if you're in, in these little areas, and you can't see the semi's mirrors right here. They have no idea that you're there. So make sure that you can always see the semi drivers outside mirrors. OK. Then we're gonna be turning the page. We're gonna to go to special vehicles at railroad crossings. I just made a little note here, honestly. Um, special vehicles at railroad crossings, and I highlighted this. It is illegal to pass any vehicle within 100 feet of a railroad crossing. Okay, so make sure that you highlight that. And we also know that another thing that is 100 feet in driver's ed is your blinkers. So basically there's two things in driver's ed that are 100 feet. You cannot pass within 100 feet of anything, intersection, um, underpass, railroad, intersection, did I say that intersection? Underpass, a tunnel, I think that's the one I was missing. So you can't pass within 100 feet of anything. And that's just to make sure that you guys are being safe. If you're like a stoplight and people are changing lanes right in the middle of intersection, that's just asking for an accident. So the two things are, it is legal to pass within 100 feet of anything. And then your blinkers are 100 feet in driver's ed. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about is a darn zipper merge. I feel like, to be honest with you, the only time that someone would get flicked off while driving is because of this darn zipper merge. I, I feel like it happens to me all the time. I've never been flicked off so much in my life of when I'm doing the zipper merge. And I do think it's because kind of a new thing. A lot of, um, of your parents were not taught this. A lot of your grandparents weren't taught this. So we're really relying on you guys to spread the message to your grandparents, to your parents and say, hey, you know what? There's this new thing called the zipper merge and you should do it. Um, 
I'll kind of give you, I'll dumb it down in my own words. And I have a video that's like one minute. It's like two cones talking. It's super corny, but it's actually really good info. Um, but the zipper merges, I live in Wyoming and I'm getting on to the freeway and it says, everybody get into the left lane. So everybody gets into the left lane super soon. Say there's construction or something like that. And then there's that one long empty lane on the right. Um, and there's always that, that one person that just like races up in the right lane and it cuts in at the last second. Um, I mean, that's kind of me. That's what I'm kind of doing. They want you to do that. They want you to utilize both lanes of traffic. And then at the point of merge, you're going to merge every other, like a zipper. They don't want you to get over there right away. They want you to, to utilize both lanes. So there's not such a, a heavy backup. There's not just tons of congestion in construction areas. Too many people are merging over too soon. And then you really should be riding in that empty lane. And I'll show you that we have these two cones talking. Um, that will kind of give you a better idea. It's kind of like corny, but it's good stuff. So here we go, two cones jogging. I bet it's gonna give me an ad. Just, I feel like I make these people money. People remember part ads. ads. So, <laughs> you don't save with Liberty Mutual. Okay, okay. <laughs> Boy, am I glad I don't drive. Look at that line. Yeah, every time. And you know, it doesn't have to be that way. What do you mean? Whenever they merge down a lane, it always backs up. But if they just do the zipper merge, that line wouldn't be so long. Zipper merge? I don't have a zipper. When drivers come up to a lane closure, they tend to get over early, which makes one long, slow line and one mostly empty lane. It's especially troublesome when that long line starts to block on ramps and access. But shouldn't you move over as soon as you see the merge sign? Not always. <laughs> when traffic is really backed up, the best thing to do is not merge early. Instead, if they had just all slow down and drive in both lanes until they get closer to the merge point, then take turns merging into the through lane, kind of like teeth on a zipper. It's a lot safer. It is. Yep, got the studies to prove it. Now, if there's no backup and traffic is moving freely, it's fine to merge early. The zipper merge is best used when traffic is heavy and things start to slow down. I still don't think it's fair for people to cut to the front of the line. But you know, if you have two lanes coming up to that merge, then there's no long line to cut in front of, is there? Oh. So it's okay to fill both lanes and take turns. It's the best way to do it. Zip the urge to merge and take turns. A message from the Kansas Department of Transportation. All right. So corny, but good stuff. <laughs> All right. Um, next thing, we have uh, two little stories about, not two stories, they're like two super short videos about who has the right of way. Or maybe it's just one. I think it's just one. So here is just going to talk to you about the right of ways before we hop into this packet. It's only a minute and a half, and then we're going to jump into this packet, and then we're going to do number five of the outline as well. But this is kind of explaining who has the right of way at intersections. I'll also explain it, but sometimes people are visual people and they need to see it as well. So here we go. <laughs> There's some pedestrians up ahead. Yeah, it looks like they want to cross. I better stop. I'm proud of you. Pedestrians have the right of way at crosswalks and at intersections, marked or unmarked. If you see a person who looks like they want to cross, you should stop. Once they step off the curb, you must stop. And be careful when you see a car stop at a crosswalk. Someone you can't see may be crossing. There's a few other right of way situations you should know about. When an emergency vehicle has its lights on, you must move to the far right side of the road and stop. If you are already in an intersection, continue through and then pull to the right and stop as soon as you can. Emergency vehicles often use the wrong side of the road to continue. So stay stopped until it is passed. Then it's a lane change. So signal, check your mirrors, and look over your shoulder. When it's safe, pull into the driving lane again. School buses with flashing red lights mean that children are exiting the bus and you are required to stop no matter what side of the road you are on. 
if you are on the opposite side of a raised barrier, this does not apply. <laughs> Whoa. All right, so now we're gonna do this pretty large packet. So if you have it printed, take that out. If you don't have it printed, honestly, it's okay. You're just gonna um, write like number one is this, number two is this. It's super easy. So if you don't have it printed, that's okay. Obviously it's always nice to have things printed, um, but you don't need to. All of the work that, like how to find the worksheet. So you're gonna find it on the main page of Google Classroom. And you're going to go to the classwork tab, and that's where you'll find this packet that we're doing, okay? So the classwork tab is what you're going to be pulling up, and it's called um, 35 Questions, Who Has the Right of Way? That's what this one's called that we're going to be doing right now. Um, so first things first, I'm going to show you kind of an image. This is all things that I want you to write down, okay? It'll be extremely hard to do this worksheet if you do not have these basic right-of-way laws written, written down, okay? So here are the right-of-way rules, okay? The person to the right always has the right-of-way. That is number one, okay? So write these down, and uh, number five is going to be one of these as well, as you can see. Um, number two, if you are turning, you lose the right-of-way. You have to remember that. If you're turning, you lose the right-of-way. So if, like one car is going straight and another car is turning, car, the car that is turning is gonna lose the right-of-way. Okay, you're gonna refer back to all of these, these things when you're doing this packet. So if you're doing the packet and you're like, oh gosh, I don't know who has the right of way, you're gonna refer back to this, okay? So either write them down, print this out, take a picture of it, whatever you gotta do, okay? Now, number three. Now, if two people are turning, yikes, right? So if two people are turning, whoever is closest to the turn is gonna have the right of way. R-O-W, when I wrote it down right here, means right of way. Maybe I can make this bigger for you guys too. So number three, if two people are turning, whoever is closest to the turn is gonna have the right of way. Okay, number four, if you're on the top of the T, okay, and that's gonna be number five. I said, what is the top of the T? Like, it's just some like open-ended question so you can't Google it and I can make sure that you watch this. You can um, write down through road. So what is the top of the T means? It means the through road right here in parentheses. So if you're on the top of the T, so it's an intersection that looks like a T, and if you are on the top, you have the right of way. So if you're on like the main road, there's never gonna be anybody, You're like if you're on the main road, you're not gonna stop in the middle of the road and let somebody from the side road come in. That's not the way it works. Like just like you're leaving your driveway. Say your driveway is the bottom of the T and the main road is the top of the T. When you leave your driveway, you're not just busting out of your driveway onto the main road, you're stopping at the end of your driveway and you're looking for a gap in traffic and then you're gonna go. So that's this exact same thing as number four. The person at the, on the main road, AKA the through road, they always are gonna have the right of way. Now, number five, always stop behind the farthest thing back, the stop line or the crosswalk. If there's nothing there, we're gonna stop two feet back from the stop sign. So we're always gonna stop behind the farthest thing back, make sure there's no pedestrians or anything like that. And then we can do what's called creep up, okay? Six, if the pedestrian even has one foot on the road, we're gonna remember that they have the right of way. If they're looking at it, they don't have the right of way, but if um, they have one foot on the road, they're gonna have the right of way. Remember, watch for yield signs, um, one way signs in this packet. Um, yield, if like one car has a yield and the other one doesn't, obviously the person with the yield signs not gonna have the right of way and the other person without the yield sign, you know, they would get to go first. Um, another thing too, I always want you guys to, and this isn't just like in driver's ed, this is just like the rest of your life. Um, but when you're at a stop sign or a stoplight, or if you're waiting to turn into a store or you're waiting in the middle of an intersection or anything like that, if you're sitting there and you're waiting to turn in your car, um, you usually you want to plan ahead of time, but not in this scenario. So if you're sitting there at an intersection and you want to make a left-hand turn, you're going to keep your wheels straight until the very last second, until you see a gap in traffic, and then you're going to turn your wheel and go. Uh, we are not going to turn our wheel ahead of time and wait for a gap in traffic and go just in case someone were to hit us from behind. If our wheel was turned, we would go right into oncoming traffic and there's a high likely that your likelihood of your passenger may pass away from getting T-boned on the passenger side. So if you keep your wheels straight and you got hit from behind, your car would just go forward, not into oncoming traffic, hopefully. If you're sitting there at the light or the stop sign and your wheels turned because you're waiting to just for the gap in traffic so you can hit the gas and go, well, if it's turned, you could kill your passenger. So when you're sitting at an intersection, a light, anything like that, 
always keep your wheels straight. There is a question about that. Just one of them in the packet here. Um, and then the next thing is the difference between a one-way and a two-way road. So a one-way are gonna be more than one set of dot, dotted lines in the center. That's white lines in the center of the road. Um, if it's usually uh, like a two-way road, that's gonna be yellow lines in the center of the road, opposite flowing traffic. Um, and then you're gonna always wanna get to your closest lane available. So if there's three lanes, Going all the same way, it's a one-way road, you're gonna to wanna to get to your closest available lane and there's another three lanes and all traffic is going the same way, you wanna to get to your closest lane available again. And I'm gonna talk you through some of this stuff. Um, so don't fret, but always get to your closest lane available. Maybe write that down for um, the next question. So number maybe seven, if you wanna write that down. Always get to your closest lane available. Okay. Now, we are going to pull up this packet here and I'm gonna explain some of them to you. And then um, and then uh, I'm gonna play a movie and then there's gonna be part three where I'm gonna explain um, all of the right-of-ways to you for the packet, okay? Um, I used, I'm actually re-recording this day because a lot of kids had trouble with this day because I didn't go over the answers. Like you guys would just turn them in and then I feel like you were a little bit lost. So the part three of today is really helpful for you guys. Cause honestly, if you don't get this right away stuff down you shouldn't be on the road. If you don't know who gets to go first in an intersection honestly, I don't think you should be driving. And I think that you could probably agree with me. Um, so make sure you're taking a screenshot of, of this right here or you're writing it down but these are things that you're gonna all need to refer back to. And this is not in the coursework tab. This is just on here right now. Okay, so take a screenshot, write, up, write it down if you want to, whatever you gotta do, pause the video, or if you forget, you can always rewind, which is nice. Um, but I'm gonna close out of this and we're gonna pull up the packet here. Okay, so it's a couple of pages long for sure. So in all of these diagrams, you are car number one. Okay, you are car number one. Okay, so. We're going to be looking at all of this. This is what the packet looks like. So if we're looking at, say, for instance, number one right here, if I'm car number one, okay, so if you imagine it, car, I'm car number one, well, car number two is going to be on my right. So car number two is going to be the right answer. You can see on each one of these pages, it's going to say, you know, what it wants you to do. Okay, so this one, for example, it says, who has right of way, number one or two? So if I'm car number one, and all of these diagrams, I am number one, well, who's the car on my right? Well, that's going to be number two. So for number one, you got a free answer. Okay. Now, number three is what we're looking at. We're looking at that through road. So number three, that would be the top of the T. Number one is on the top of the T. So there's really two reasons on number three why one answer would be right over the other answer. So if we're looking at number three, remember if we're turning, we lose the right of way. The right of way is going to go to the car that's going straight. And then there's another reason why the other number one would have the right of ways because number one is on that through road, okay? Number two is on the side road. Number one's not gonna stop in the middle of the main road and be like, hey dude from the side road, wanna come in? Like that's not gonna happen. So number three, the answer is number one because not car number one is going straight and um, car two is turning and car two is on the side road. Um, so as you can see, when we're doing this, it's gonna ask you why for each question. So you can see it on your outline here. On some of them, I have, why is this the right answer? Um, I want you to write it just like that. So number three, the reason why number one is correct is because car one is going straight, car two is turning. So they have lost the right of way. And then car number one is on the through road. So on some of these, um, it does ask you on the right of way packet, why? So you will have to give me the why. And honestly, I know it's kind of tedious and you're probably like, God, this is lame, but it's good for you. Um, you have to know why. So like number four, let's go over that one. So on number four, two cars are turning. Okay. Now, if you look back, what did I say about two cars turning? Who has the right of way if both of the cars are turning? whoever is closest to the turn. So on number four, what if it asks why, you would say, well, number one has the right of way because they're closest to the turn. They're both turning, yes, but whoever is closest to the turn would have the right of way, number one. Okay, so you can do the rest of these yourself. 
And then I'm going to have, I'm going to ask you for a why on some of them. So make sure that you're writing that down. Why? I need to know the why. Um, like number nine, for example, the pedestrians in the middle of the road, you can see that. Number 11, you can see the one has a yield sign, one does not. Okay, so make sure that you're checking all of that out. Um, you're going to want to pay attention to the colors of the lights when you're doing this packet. Um, do you guys know which color the, the order of the lights go? Like what color is at the top? And what color is at the bottom? Okay, so make sure that you know that. Hopefully you guys already know that it's um, red at the top, then it's yellow, and then it's gonna be green. And that's gonna ask you it at the end of the packet as well, if you guys know the order of that. Um, then we're cruising, checking all these out. These are pretty standard. Um, not, I, honestly, I'm not gonna go over any of those with you right now. I feel like you guys could handle all of that. On number 23, this is where I was talking about, do you wanna keep the wheels straight or turn them? Um, number 24 is the most common intersection. It's just a four-way stop by your house. I just wanna know if you know which way traffic flows. Number 25, so here's where the difference between a one-way and a two-way road, okay? So 25 here, you can see 25, there's a one-way sign right underneath it. So all one, two, and three, all traffic is going in the same direction. Where you can see where this car is, there's a solid line right here. So that's indicating a break in traffic where cars would be going in the opposite direction. So for 25, if you wanted to get to your closest lane available, and you need to get to your closest lane available, if you don't do that on your test on at Arden Hills, it is an automatic fail. Or if you don't, there's a one-way in Pine City, there's a one-way in Lindstrom on the test. If you do not get to your closest lane available, it is an automatic fail. So like 25, what would be your closest lane to you? What would be number three? 26, now let's check this out. 26, uh, you wanna get to your closest lane and then get into your closest lane available again. So if you're in lane four, I need you to get into lane three and then get into lane three again. Okay, now make sure you pay attention on 26 right here, one, two, and three, that's all a one-way road. That's all traffic going in the same direction. Now, if there was a solid line right here in two, we would know that traffic would be flowing in the opposite direction. So you have to make sure that you're not getting into the wrong lane of traffic. Like 29 here, as you can see, there's a solid line. So that's indicating that traffic is now going the opposite way there. Okay, now 30, if you're looking at this, there is a solid line over here. So make sure you know which way traffic flows. Um, the only time you would not have to get to your closest lane available is if there were arrows on the ground, just like this. They're painted just like the crosswalk. They're big arrows on the ground. You can go from this, the first lane to the first lane or on number two. If you were in lane number two, you can go to two to two or two to one. You can go do a couple of different things or if there's some arrows on the ground. If there are no arrows on the ground, you are forced to get to your closest lane available all the time. If you do not, it's an automatic fail in the road test. Um, now, since COVID, they don't give you a full test. They just kind of turn it off and they're like, all right, you're, you failed. Let's go back to the beginning. So they're kind of harsh about it. So make sure that you know what you're doing. And then it's going to ask you a few questions over here. This time we're going to do some right turns on the last page. And then um, it's going to ask you some questions down here about the stoplight colors. Um, but make sure um, that you are answering the whys on the outline. And then we talked about number five, it said about the through road. Okay, the top of the T, we also called it the through road. So make sure that you filled that out. Um, but then I will have a little correction worksheet or I'll have a correction video. If like, I feel like that you got a lot of them wrong. I will send you a correction video to you personally in your email. So it'll kind of be like a separate video um, that you will only get if I feel like that you needed a, a little a bit of an explanation to each question. I'm not going to send it to everybody. If you if I feel like you did great at it and your explanations are great, I won't send it to you. Um, but if you did need a little bit extra help, I will send you the video. And then there's like an extra little outline in there to make sure that you actually watched it because obviously you need a little extra help and that's okay. I remember when I took driver's ed, this stuff was hard. <laughs> so make sure that you are doing that. Um, filling it out to the best of your ability. I am going to play a video now and um, that will conclude kind of my portion of the day. And then you guys can work on, there's a couple of worksheets that are due. So make sure that you are turning in the outline, make sure that you are turning in. Um, so that would be the 35 question right of way packet that I just kind of showed you on the screen. So you'll be turning in the packet you will be uh, turning in the outline. So there's two things right there. You will be doing the 10 question. Um, oh, let's, let's see right here. I'll show you a picture of it. It says, 
it's like there's two questions at the top and then it's one through 10 um, on the bottom portion. So it's really a 12 question worksheet. Uh, but it's just asking you to describe who would have the right of way. So it's 12 questions. That would be the third thing that you're going to turn in. And you can find that on the coursework tab or the classwork tab, excuse me. Um, and then the last thing that you are going to be doing is taking that Kahoot. So if you don't take the Kahoot, honestly, I can't give you credit for the day. So make sure that you are doing that as well. That's just going to be the chapter, the chapter quiz on the Kahoot. So make sure that you are turning in the outline. You are turning in the uh, 35 question packet. You are turning in the 10 question worksheet. Well, it's 10, it says 10, but it's really 12 because it goes one, two, and it starts over at one through 10. So make sure you're turning that worksheet as well. And make sure that you are doing the Kahoot. If this is your last day of driver's ed, um, email me and because some people have makeup days, so they watch these videos. So me email me, tell me if you want your blue slip or not. If this is just your regular third day of class, make sure that you are turning this in. Your name is in the subject line, your first and last name, and then you're putting day three in the subject line. If you don't, it makes it very hard for me to correct. So make sure you're doing that for me. And then you're attaching all of your emails, like your screenshots of your work. Um, and you're attaching that in the email for me so I can correct that. You will only have um, extra homework if I feel like that you need a little bit more help on that right of ways worksheet. So you might have some extra stuff. So make sure that you're always checking back and making sure that I didn't say, hey, I need you to do this or hey, I need you to do that. Sometimes I do do that. If I feel like you're not getting it, I make you do a little bit of extra stuff. I know it's annoying, but it's good for you. Um, so that other worksheet that I've been talking about, I suppose I can just show you an image right here. This is the other one that I'm talking about. So you have to turn this in, the big packet, your outline, and then make sure that you're doing the Kahoot, okay? But I'm going to play a video right now, and then after the video, I'm just going to set you guys loose, and then uh, you can just turn all that stuff in by the end of the day today. Don't turn it in tomorrow. It's due today, okay? So here's our video, and then you guys will be good to go. Sebastian is a child. Quiet. Well, Sebastian is a very creative kid, so he drew and he, he was kind of like a master Lego builder. Sebastian and I have been dating for our seventh year. This will be our seventh year. Whenever I need anything, he's always there. So he's reliable. So my family's pretty crazy. I really love my mom. My dad, he's like a super intense guy. Being the oldest, there's a little bit more pressure. Like I feel like I get a lot more pressure from my parents to do things right because I do have my younger brothers watching me. I work part time at John Scramble Pizza. It's actually um, gotten to the position of a team lead, which is a certified trainer. But in our store, it's also being a leader. I am studying civil engineering. Um, I'm looking to become a structural engineer, where I'll be designing buildings and bridges. It was New Year's, um, New Year's Day. I was really tired, didn't get a lot of sleep that day. Being ready for work, average day. Um, you know, I asked my boss, you know, hey, um, I'm not too feeling too well, I'm really tired, can I go home? I got in the car, my parents' big old Ford Expedition, and yeah, I was a little tired, but I felt it was manageable. I remember telling myself at one point, you know, like, pull over. Like, you, you need to pull over. But as I got closer and closer to home, I just felt like I could make it there because, you know, I've driven sleepy before, made it fine. I just closed my eyes for what felt like just a few seconds. And... I opened them and I was in the intersection. And then I collided with another car. My initial thought was like, oh my God, like what just happened? He said, yeah, I got into a car accident and there was another person. And I don't know if she's, she's gonna make it. 
I remember the ambulance coming up, the fire truck and that whole deal. And they had to, you know, bring the jaws of life to pull Sydney out of the car. They pulled her, they pulled her out of the car. And I just see her body hoping that she's still alive. I remember the seeing the the two paramedics that were helping her hug each other. And that's when I knew that I had killed someone. You know, you hear about accidents and emergencies and tragedies on TV, and you say that's not going to happen to me. But here it was. It was happening, and it was real. You know, for the day or two after, he was just so in shock, just trying to absorb it. He didn't want to get up. He, he was kind of laying in his bed like in a fetal position, and, you know, he didn't want to make eye contact and definitely didn't want to talk about it. Sometimes there's stuff that he's going through that I know is hard for him to talk to me about. Knowing that he'd had to blame himself every day for killing someone. Sebastian is not a bad kid. He is a good kid who made good choices up until the point he decided to drive drowsy. Um, and that decision cost the life of somebody else made an incredible loss for another family and changed Sebastian's life forever. I don't really drive anymore. I pretty much bike wherever I need to go and my girlfriend helps me out. I think Sebastian has chosen to share his story because he can't undo what's happened, but he can still make a difference. And from what we've been told and heard about Sydney Weekly, she was a forgiving person and a giving person and wanted to be a person that made a difference. If the situation was reversed, I can only understand the parents' pain. My kids are everything to me. Everything. And the love that parents for Sydney, I know it was everything to me. She was everything to them. Prior to the crash, I didn't see sleepy or drowsy driving as a distraction. Uh, Sydney's death was definitely preventable. I can honor Sydney's parents and their wishes because they had asked me that my message gets across to other people. So the next time that they ever think about just a tiny distraction, whether it's picking up your phone or changing a song, or in my case, if you're feeling just a bit drowsy to just pull over, you know, stretch, take a breather, it is such a great service that people like Sebastian do to educate us, to warn us. It's important for your family. It's important for my family. It's important for everybody who's out on the roadway. If you need to take a nap, take a short 10 minute nap. That's okay. You're going to get where you need to go eventually. I'll never forget Sydney. I actually got a tattoo on my arm in a place that I can see it to remind me that I'm not just living for myself but I'm living in her name too. All right, guys, so make sure that you are um, doing the pack of getting your closest lane available and you're referring back to those um, 
kind of rules of the road um, so you can make sure that you're doing this packet properly. So these things right here, you're gonna always wanna be referring back to these when you are doing this packet. Um, and you're going to also make sure that on the outline, on some of the questions I have, you know, why did you pick that answer? There's two reasons why you should have. I need to know both of those. If you're not sure, refer back to these bullets. Leaving the outline blank is not an option on any day. Um, so if you're not sure, go back and watch. If you're not sure, text me. If you're not sure, ask your parent. Um, you need to know why if you're going to be driving on the road. So I need to make sure that you guys know what is going on. Okay, so make sure if you guys have any questions, you're always able to text me. Um, I don't have your number saved, so maybe just say, hey, this is so-and-so, I need a question about this, and I'll definitely help you, but just remember, I don't have your number saved, so when you're reaching out to me, say your name so I know who you are. <laughs> um, but other than that, if you guys have any questions, like I said, reach out, but good luck. Turn in, turn in all the right stuff. You guys have to make sure that you're getting stuff done um, on the same day that we do class and you're turning in all the work that same night. It's not due tomorrow, it's due today, okay? Any questions, again, reach out. I know I say it all the time, but don't be shy. Um, that's the reason um, I'm here to help you. So don't feel shy, okay, guys? But otherwise, have a great night or day or whatever time of day you're watching this, but I'll see you guys later. Bye.